The following is a presentation of Geekster Media. Remember that show back then. Remember that show. Turn on the TV, time was always flying. Why did they have to end? So many shows you forgotten. Hey there, TV lovers, and welcome to episode 15 of Remember That Show, the podcast where we revisit the obscure or forgotten TV shows of the 80s and 90s. I'm William Bruce West, and we hope you're not listening to this episode from a hospital bed. But if you are, we've got the best medicine, a 40-year-old laugh track and plenty of fluids. And I'm Adam Pope, and we want to assure you that our staff here at the RTS Memorial Hospital are well-trained actors who have played multiple roles as medical professionals in television and film over the years, so they're sure to have picked up some actual skills from saving all those fictional lives, right? Right? Now, Will and I uh, were recently guests on the Totally Rad Christmas podcast, and it was to discuss an episode of the series we're here to talk about tonight, which neither of us had ever seen. We were so fascinated by it that we decided we actually wanted to discuss the show's entire single season legacy. But before we do that, we have to take an ambulance ride back to our own TV obsessed childhoods in a segment we call Theme Song. If there's one thing that could make a sick day bearable as a kid, it was the promise of being able to watch TV all day long while you were waiting for that fever to go down. Adam, do you have any memories of watching daytime TV shows while staying home from school? Yeah, sick days to me, they were like stepping into another dimension of TV. There were all these programs I didn't know existed. Morning talk shows, you get your Regis and Kathy Lee, and it felt like they were always talking to celebrities that were past their prime, or I just didn't know who they were, you know, I just couldn't connect. Then like, there were all these reruns of 70s and 80s sitcoms, One Day at a Time, Alice, Too Close for Comfort, you know, they were in, in syndication because I was too young to have caught them during their prime time years, but I was just like, I don't know if I'm connecting with these shows. Plus, my mom would then turn on The Young and the Restless or Days of Our Lives, so I'd have to endure that. You know, my seven-year-old self was not interested. Uh, most memorable for me from daytime TV though, I feel like it was the commercials for accident lawyers, modeling schools, auto insurance companies, correspondence courses are like these trade schools where you would learn to be a computer programmer, dental hygienist, TV repairman, you know, or whatever it was other huge list that would scroll right i actually i faked sick one time in like second or third grade so i could stay home and watch tv because i was like oh it's gonna be so great i know there's all this tv i'm missing and i was just so disappointed after like two hours i told my mom i was faking can i go to school <laughs> It was just never for me. It just, it, the daytime TV bored me for whatever reason. It didn't connect. But what about for you? Yeah, the same. I mean, like, they weren't really putting the hip shows in the daytime, you know? Like, syndication, it trended towards evenings. So, like, in the middle of the day, it was always, like, Jefferson's Good Times. All those, like, cheap syndicated Norman Lear shows. And by cheap, I mean they just didn't cost much by that point in time. But you were right with the daytime commercials we we had ITT Tech and Lincoln Technical Institute and local lawyers like Science and Kirk and Greenberg and Betterman. Now we have Mike Slocum, the DC Hammer, who apparently is the hammer in a lot of states because when traveling, I found out he's also the Alabama Hammer. So I feel betrayed there. <laughs> like I love the commercials more than the shows. But I remember like sick days were always where I got to see these shows I had heard of. But based on when they aired, I had never seen, especially like the kids stuff. There was this show it was from Deke. It was called the Beverly Hills Teens. And like, 
there's nothing really notable about this cartoon except for they had a swimming pool in their limo like that's always the visual i remember and it was like the tail end of cartoons in the morning so it was like like school had started by the time it aired but you would see it if you were home for a sick day or even that first season of power rangers because in dc i don't know how fox kids did it like nationally like fox kids over time hammered out a national national schedule but in the very beginning it was a little something of like a free-for-all affiliates did what worked best for them so like mighty Morphin power rangers came on at 2 30 that first season in maryland and i mean school didn't get out until like 2 25 Five, and then like I still lived like 20 minutes away so like on a good day I would get to see the like thanks for the juice Ernie that was some battle but like you never got to see the actual like episode you know it was always that coda with the human interaction so like when I was sick I would actually get to see like oh there's a green ranger now <laughs> and things like that so those are my fond memories it's funny you mentioned Beverly Hills teens I literally just found like the V VHS copy that was released with just like two episodes on it. And I was like, I have never heard of this show before. And I watched it and I'm like, this is like Dynasty for kids, rich kids, like just kind of being snotty. It's like they're all Veronica's. It's sort of Archie, but a little bit. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe we'll cover it someday, but it's kind of boring. So I don't know it's that we need to. <laughs> it's so unmemorable and it's not the hip Beverly Hills that we would come to know from 90210. This is the like Rodeo Drive Beverly Hills that kids have no attachment to at this time. It's like maybe their parents are like, ooh, I want to go to California and go to Beverly Hills. But kids, it meant nothing. But swimming pool in your limo, what are you going to do? Yeah, I, I do feel like they could have used a little bit more wackiness uh, of the Beverly Hills teens. And I do feel as well, like this show does their best to bring some entertaining and quirky characters into their hospital for emergency treatment. But maybe we had some emergency treatment when we were kids. Well, I'm curious, what is the worst injury you sustained as a kid? Did you ever end up in the emergency room yourself? Oh my gosh, I lived in the emergency room. <laughs> like my backstory and Will, I probably said this before, my mom mom had me late like she was 43 when she had me and so she kind of grew up like post-depression era all that so it's like i got all the amenities she didn't have so like while most people would go to like doctors i guess her government insurance was like nope we're going to the emergency room i lived in the emergency room we have holy cross hospital like i would go for, for periodic like pediatrician checkups but like really bad headache let's go down to holy cross <laughs> like that that pain didn't go away let's go down to Holy Cross, which sucks because you're sitting in the waiting room for like four hours before they even see you. So it's like you go to Holy Cross at like 9 p.m. and that's your night. <laughs> so like I was always in the emergency room, but it was never for anything major. I to this day, and I'm gonna jinx myself because I think I'm cursed right now. I've never broken a bone. So it's like, I don't have that like, oh, we were climbing a tree at Mr. McGuffin's farm and I fell out. I don't have that story. The worst thing I sustained, I got really bad gas from eating too much ice cream. Like to the <laughs> point where it was like inflammation of the stomach. Like they were like, oh. don't go near dairy for quite some time. To get real like retro about it, they had just come out with those Disney popsicles, but they, they were like shaped like the characters, but yeah. they had vanilla ice cream in them. And I went crazy one summer and yeah, so I was in severe pain from that. But yeah, that's probably the worst I can think of. How about you? <laughs> oh, well, I mean, I technically went to the emergency room when I was like five. I, I had disturbed a bee's nest. My friend and I were playing in our backyard. We got stung a bunch and I remember getting stung and I remember running in the house. But apparently after my parents kind of like laid me down for a nap or whatever to calm me down, I started swelling up. Like I was looking like Martin Short in that forgotten 80s comedy, Pure Luck. Anybody? And so they had to take me to the emergency room. But I only know that as a story my parents you know, have recounted and said, you're allergic to bees my whole life, but I haven't been stung since then. But the, the one I remember that I was, you know, actually cognizant for, I guess, was in junior high, I was walking home with my friend and he was riding his bike next to me just slowly. Then another kid from our school, he kind of zoomed by on his bike and like tapped him on the head like, hey, try to catch me, you know, just playing around. So he started 
speeding up and I just instinctively, I was like, hey dude, where are you going? And I like grabbed his backpack and I pulled him back. And so him and his bike, like they fell on top of me and he yelled at me. He's like, you idiot, what were you doing? You know? So we're like dusting ourselves off and just start walking again. And then my leg stiffened up and I'm like, what's wrong? And I looked out and my sock is just soaked with blood. I'm like, what's happening? And his bike had gouged a huge chunk out of my shin. And so like I grabbed like some notebook paper out of my backpack and like tried to soak up the blood, stop the bleeding or whatever. I'm like, save me, Lisa Frank. And so, yeah, so basically I got to his house, his mom called my dad. So I went to an urgent care, not an ER, but kind of same difference. I had to get stitches for the first time in my life. I still have a scar down there to this day. So that was like my first experience with emergency medical care. I learned my lesson. Just let him go. (laughs) He's going to take off. Let him go. Well, I guess I have a follow-up question then. Like when you were growing up, were urgent care facilities common in your neck of the woods? Around here? That wasn't a thing like let's say 15 years ago like now it's like everything is either an urgent care or a dispensary but like before that you had to go to the emergency room so it sounds like california maybe got urgent care before we did it's possible i remember it was called the walk-in clinic and i don't know how big a difference there is between an urgent care and a walk-in clinic but i'm just used to saying urgent care now yeah because they're so prevalent for sure so here's the thing you know i i uh, i could have been in that waiting room and i might have been seeing a rerun of this show we're gonna talk about today but i'd be curious to know why did it exist why did it get the green light <laughs> Well, TV viewers have long been fascinated by the lives of doctors and nurses on duty. Whether it was dueling primetime medical dramas like Ben Casey and Dr. Kildare in the 1960s, or the long-running soap opera General Hospital. A touch of comedy entered the picture in the 70s thanks to Alan Alda on MASH, a decade in which a detective angle was added to a doctor show thanks to Jack Klugman and Quincy M.E. And even the show emergency gave ambulance drivers and emergency room doctors the spotlight by the 80s saint elsewhere was a hit for nbc and dr cliff huxtable on the cosby show became a television institution empty nest and his spinoff nurses also gave us a peek into the lives of medical professionals during this time so adam who was your favorite tv doctor growing up It's weird because obviously like all those shows that were mentioned, I didn't really watch. I mean, I know I've said in the past I watched Nurses, but it wasn't like, oh, I'm so connected to these characters. It was just like, oh, this is on, you know? So I ask you, is it wrong that my choice is Dr. Zoidberg from Futurama? And my runner-up is Lisa Turtle's mom from Saved by the Bell? Like, that's what came to mind immediately to me. (laughs) We saw her twice and only once in a medical capacity. (laughs) (laughs) But she was at the hospital where Zach was getting his leg taken care of. But I mean, it's just like if it's someone with the title of doctor, then I feel like it's a tie between Dr. Tina McGee of the 1990 The Flash series or Frasier Crane. But like if it's medical doctors, it's this inept crab alien who warbles when he gets excited. Mom, young lady. And I'm like, honorable mention also to Dr. Space Time from community but that's outside our purview here (laughs) what about you will well i mean we we mentioned basically all the ones that had an effect on me it's like i won't say it's my favorite but surely from our demographic the most prevalent would be the people of the 4077 mobile army surgical hospital you know like it was always on but like you kind of go through phases at least I did it's like I went through the phase of like I hated MASH then I learned to tolerate MASH then there was the spike of I loved MASH and then I was like wait you're 11 why do you love MASH you know so it was like but any other instance like that's the one that stands out to me of like these are doctors like the Cosby show 
I never really processed that he was an OBGYN. I mean, his office is in his basement, and you only saw like one episode of that a season. So it's like that didn't hit home. I would say Dr. Harry Weston from Empty Nest, but even then, he just happens to be a doctor, and sometimes it's at the hospital. So, I mean, prevalent and like, I gotta go with MASH, even if it's like not my favorite favorite like even saying elsewhere i can't remember watching a single episode but because of the tommy westfall theory as a student of pop culture saying elsewhere is very important too <laughs> so it's, it's like why would it connect with us now i feel like in the 90s the trend was in full swing because you had this unique twist right oh a teenage prodigy becoming a physician on doogie hauser md you know like that was a big deal so that's 1990 that's right at the start of the decade but then all of a sudden we have northern exposure about this doctor you know that moves up to this remote town dr quinn medicine woman literally in the title there right diagnosis murder starring dick van dyke i mean that's just that's taking the talents of a doctor to, you know, to a new extreme i would say you know I mean, and of course there was one show that dominated the decade for primetime drama er a created by jurassic park author michael crichton who wrote a script based on his own experiences as a medical student working in an emergency room and eventually after his big success with jurassic park it's getting adapted into a television show so will did you watch this much more popular version of ER in the 90s? Yes, but I came to it late. Like when we did the Parker Lewis episode, we said that like it went head to head with the Ferris Bueller show and they had their different camps. Well, people forget ER went head to head with CBS's Chicago Hope. And I was a Chicago Hope person. Like I really loved it. It had Christine Lottie and Vondi Curtis Hall and it had the guy from Ghostbusters. 2 who's obsessed with Vigo and I know people are going to hate me for not saying his name but Peter it's McNichol day. yes there you go <laughs> so it was like I recognized more people from Chicago Hope for me ER was like Booker from Roseanne and Goose from Top Gun you know so it was like I did Chicago Hope for like five seasons I didn't come over to ER till maybe season like seven and then I watched it till the end I probably missed most of Clooney because Clooney kind of leaves around from dusk till dawn and doesn't really stay much longer and so like I hop on when like Noah Wiley becomes the main guy basically so how about you did you watch it well before I get to that I do want to say you met you started mentioning Parker Lewis and Abraham Ben Ruby ends up on the show right so Kubiak yes. <laughs> goes yes. over to ER. But no, I had no interest in ER or any other primetime medical drama. Like, I didn't watch Grey's Anatomy, and then I didn't watch Scrubs, even though that's funny, and I probably should have. I've never seen an episode of Scrubs. What? Like, yeah, I just I think you'd love Scrubs. Probably, yeah. But it's like, to me, like, especially in those early days, you know, mid-90s even, if it didn't have laughs, adventure, or science fiction, I just wasn't going to watch it as a general rule as TV. And I eventually did tune in to an episode or two, probably like season three, because by then it was such a pop culture sensation. It was being referenced all the time. Like, I wanted to understand, like, why do people love this show? And I'm just like, mm, no, I'll watch Friends instead. And I only took notice probably because George Clooney was cast as Batman. And I'm like, well, let me see. He's that guy from ER, right? Let me go see what... Oh, okay, never mind. <laughs> but it just, it never appealed to me. Like, I, the ones I tuned in for, I'm like, hey, this Eric LaSalle guy is being really overdramatic. I'm wondering who this Noah Wiley guy is. Like, I, so I ignored it for years until... My friend, who I mentioned on the Mad TV episode, Nassim Padron, contacted me all excited saying she had gotten cast in a small recurring role on this show. She was Nurse Surrey. Uh, she was on a few episodes. So and that was her first, like, big major role she was cast in on uh, something that had notoriety. So she, that was exciting. I was excited for her. But I didn't watch past, like, one episode to just be like, oh, that's cool. Like it was, But it was the same, like, when she was on New Girl years later. I was like, that's awesome. I know someone in the cast but i didn't really like the show to begin with so i'm not gonna stick around so yeah just er was never for me 
I think the draw to the medical shows for me, because I'm squeaming. Like, I could never be a homicide detective or a doctor or anything, because the sight of blood, I'm going to faint. Like, even if they're drawing my own. But in the mid to late 90s, the most provocative stuff was going on on medical shows. ER had the, like, broadcast. It wasn't, like, the first time, but it was one of the major times somebody says... I don't know if we have a label on this show. So somebody says the S word because Anthony Edwards character is like dying from cancer. And it's like his final episode where he's realizing like he's facing his mortality. And it's like, as whatever age, I, was, I guess I was like 12 or 13. It's like, wow, he just said that on NBC or like on Chicago Hope. They showed a topless woman during surgery. And that was like a big thing with like the parent council. Cause like, it's like, why are you doing this? But like, this is what surgery would be and it was a non-sexual manner in which it was depicted but still 13 year old wills like boobs on cbs so it's like that's how they reeled me in. that is interesting yeah because i i didn't know that about er the only stunt the er got in my memory was when they did a live episode right where they just they filmed it live and i was like that's pretty cool like it, it's that's been done since like 30 rock did that and I, I know there's been a bunch of those but it was just, at the time i was like that was the first time i'd ever heard of it actually a show that never gets enough credit and i was talking to somebody on social media about it recently and it falls in our criteria is the fox show rock because they actually kind of piloted that the entire final season of of rock is live oh like it's one of those like hail mary plays of like we got to get these ratings up somehow so every episode was live and it's like a stage show the live episode became the same kind of gimmick as the musical episode but i've never seen another series try to do it regularly you know so just something to check out one day yeah, but, that's I watched Rock, but I never paid attention to that. Speaking of things I didn't know, this show, we're here to talk about this episode. So, Will, why don't you give us our elevator pitch? So ER was a mostly comedic primetime sitcom that aired on CBS for one season from September 1984 to February 1985. Much like the long-running NBC drama series developed by Michael Crichton, this ER was conceived by an actual medical doctor who first wrote it as a play, which became very successful in 1982 when staged by the Organic Theater Company of Chicago, run by Stuart Gordon. The series was then developed for television in a one-hour pilot that was picked up for a full season of 22 episodes. The series focused on the day-to-day -day adventures of the quirky emergency room staff at the Clark Street Hospital in Chicago, with two members of the stage play cast crossing over to play the characters they originated. These were Shuko Akane as the ER receptionist Maria and her love interest officer Fred Burdock, played by Bruce A. Young. Yeah, and though it was an ensemble show, show the main star of the series was elliot gould as the wisecracking and slacking dr howard scheinfeld he was surrounded by the no-nonsense head of the department dr eve sheridan played in the pilot by marcia strassman but for the series was played by mary mcdonnell uh there was the salt of the earth head nurse joan thor played by kajada farrell sassy nurse julie williams played by lynn moody and awkward nurse Corey smith played by Corinne Borer. Uh, also in the mix were Harold G. Schilling as the surly orderly Richard, and eventually mid-season, a young kid named George Clooney showed up as Ace. <laughs> so, Will, we both already admitted when we were on Totally Rad Christmas that we have never seen this show. Like, th this is not something that even in reruns we ran across, but it does have a very recognizable cast. So, who from this cast were you most familiar with, or what other roles do you associate them with? This one came as a shock because 
it has always come up in trivia of like, did you know there's another ER and Clooney was on it too? So I always kind of thought he would have had a bigger role. But like going into it, I mean, the biggest one, of course, is Elliot Gould. And I think I probably mentioned this on Totally Rad Christmas, but I've kind of gone on this deep dive of Elliot Gould lately because I only knew him as Monica and Ross's dad on Friends. He was just this guy who was like, oh, he was a good character actor, but I put him in that same column as like Richard Kind, you know? Like, I didn't think there was anything to him. And then... I've gotten really into physical media, like the collection of it, and like Kino Lorber is like one of those boutique labels, and they had a bunch of old Elliot Gould movies, and then like I did like this deep dive of like, wait, he was a leading man? He was like Mr. It in Hollywood? So then it turns into this like, where did he fall off? You know, like he was the man, and then he gets ER. And then it seems like he just kind of like resurfaces with friends. So like he was definitely the one who stood out to me of like, he feels almost wasted here, but like it fills in some blanks of my Elliot Gould mystery, you know, but like he was the main one. Conchata Pharrell, Two and a Half Men. I know it's not classy to be like, oh, I love Two and a Half Men. I loved Two and a Half Men. Like, I watched every episode, all the seasons, even through when they bring in Ashton Kutcher and give it the soft reboot, and Conchata Pharrell is there the whole time, basically playing the same salt-of-the-earth character who she grounds the rest of the absurdity going on around her. I have loved her through that, so it was great seeing her. And then, like, the final one is Harold G. Schilling, because he's Richard here, but I knew him growing up as Dr. Samuels, the prince of Millard Fillmore High on Head of the Class. So those were like the three people who really kind of like, hey, it's that guy. Hey, it's her. Hey, it's him. But how about you? Who who jumped out at you? And I'll just admit again, never seen an episode of Two and a Half Men. Never seen How what? I Met Your Mother. I've never seen any of these shows that everybody talks about all the time. Like modern TV, I don't watch. I haven't watched It's Not Streaming Network TV in probably 15 years. I, just, I, I just smell a spinoff. <laughs> We're going to introduce you to every, like, wait till we get to the Big Bang Theory. It's going to be the most controversial episode we've ever done. <laughs> that, I've only seen that because my wife has binged it and I've sat in on a few episodes. But yeah, definitely got to catch up. So for me, like a lot of these people, I know them. It, it's actually less the main cast. Like I had seen them in things, especially Elliot Gould. I knew who he was, but it's mainly the character actors who come in for guest appearances. The ones who had to stand behind the white line as patients. Like Dennis Berkeley. He was always playing like the big bearded biker guys on 80s TV. I know him best from the Polly Shore movie Son-in-Law where he played Theo, but he didn't have a beard. It's like, oh, unrecognizable, Theo. Christopher Hewitt, aka Mr. Belvedere, Mr. Belvedere. shows up for an episode. He's Maria's long lost father. Like what? Future sitcom stars, you know, David Faustino uh, from Married with Children, Max Wright from ALF, they make appearances. Kevin Peter Hall, a.k.a. Harry from Harry and the Hendersons, the guy who was in the costume, and he was also the Predator. He comes and played a basketball player. Like, even future Cobra Kai star, obviously he had been in the Karate Kid, but William Zabka is in there. <laughs> a a pre-Die Hard in NYPD Blue, Dennis Franz makes an appearance as a big jerk. Uh, but not a cop. Because he normally plays cops. And I was like, is his badge in the car? <laughs> That's what I was going to say. Is he off duty? We just don't see it. Uh, but like Terry Kaiser, he's a, he was on every sitcom. Of course he's going to show up here. <laughs> Obviously his big role that a lot of people know from Weekend at Birdie's Jonathan Silverman plays Elliot Gould's son, David, and he's got like a punk rock blue mohawk or whatever. Like that was kind of crazy. So like that, there's just all the people that came through the ER. I was like, this is pretty awesome. And then the cast that I didn't know, I was just like, this is really interesting. Cause I'm like, why didn't they do more? Why didn't we see more of them? But maybe we did and I just missed it. But Will, I want to pass it back to you because before we get into our cheers and jeers, we got to talk about the huge cameo in the pilot episode. A sign that this sitcom was moving on up. <laughs> Tell us all about it. Yeah, like, 
I don't think you can even call it a cameo because like he's a substantial part of this episode but for whatever reason Sherman Hensley as George Jefferson himself appears in the pilot because his niece happens to be Nurse Julie and he's in town to get her father's watch and it's this whole like run around throughout the three acts of he comes in he's forced to stand behind the white line they actually use him to establish a lot of what you need to know about this hospital of like when you come to the front desk you stand behind the white line you don't mess with nurse thor you know like he's kind of like holding your hand throughout but the weird thing about it is that like this show is not a spin-off this show is almost like a wreck con spinoff like the only thing i can think of that's similar to it is when mclean stevenson left mash he got his own sitcom called hello larry when he was like a radio dj and at some point in hello larry they decide that he and philip drummond were army buddies so there is a crossover with different strokes but the show's like, they were never intended to be related. And the only similarities here between ER and the Jeffersons is they both were produced by Embassy Communications. But it's like, they don't share writers. They don't, like... This doesn't even have any association with Norman Lear, while The Jeffersons is one of Lear's biggest shows. So it's just, it's so strange. Like, it's, it's definitely like a foot-in-the-door tactic of like, here's this guy you know and love, and he's going to take you into this new world. And they use him a lot. It's not your typical cameo of like, he pops in, he's like, oh, I'm in the wrong place. Like, no, he is throughout the whole episode. He's in character even though certain things I don't necessarily think work here, but like, it's just, it's so strange. I've never witnessed anything like it, but it showed that they were really trying to, I guess, give this show legs. There's another thing that I don't know where we would put it later, but I have to bring it up that watching this on YouTube, those were original recordings sometimes. I didn't realize this show got the lead into the MASH finale. Can you fathom? Now, the lead out sometimes matters more because you've already got like the audience there. Statistically, there's no bigger ratings event in the history of television to date than the MASH finale. And ER did not capitalize on it whatsoever. Now, here's the thing I have to ask because so it wasn't the pilot, right? It was the first episode of the series. Right. It was in. not the pilot. I think they might have even done because the weirder thing, MASH didn't end in May. You know, yeah. MASH ended in like October, which is weird because like, I guess seasons weren't as established as we've come to know them, but it just like, you would assume MASH would have ended like no later than the first week of June, but this was an October finale. So it was not the pilot of ER. It was like episode three because the pilot is considered episodes one and two. Yeah, it's very strange. And in fact, because I looked it up because I was like, it said that. But according to like everything else online, MASH ended in 83, not 84. And so I'm like, wait, who is reporting incorrectly? Like, I don't know where, where the, the mix up is, but it's clearly on there. It's like coming up the series finale of MASH. That's crazy if they had that much confidence in this show to be the next big medical dramedy, basically, because MASH was the same idea where sometimes it's going to be serious and sometimes it's going to be funny. MASH obviously had a mix of that that worked really well because it lasted so long. So I think they just thought, well, it could work with this one too. Right. And like, like you said, I doubted it at first because the original commercials are in that episode and they show it to you. And I thought maybe it was a rebroadcast, but then when they're rolling the credits and you get that audio of like coming up next is the two and a half hour series finale of MASH. And I'm like, wow, this show did nothing with that. <laughs> so interesting. But you know, we're here, Will, because just seeing one episode for a podcast guest appearance, we were fascinated. There was something about this show that got our attention. It got us wanting to talk some more. So let's find out what we loved about it as we get into our cheers. <laughs> If I could give this compliment to a show and it's it comes up often for me, it's working. This show is legitimately funny. 
The joke writing is fantastic. Each character's dialogue is uniquely them, and it's not afraid to get a little edgy with the jokes. Like, I feel like when we look back on 80s sitcoms, we might laugh because there's a warm feeling. We give them a pass for nostalgia's sake, but a lot of the humor is hokey, it's vaudevillian, or it's whatever. It's just, it doesn't hold up. But the jokes on this show... There's something timeless, even about just the relationships and the attitudes in the show. It feels contemporary. I don't feel like, oh, this is so 80s, aside from a few you know, fashion choices here and there. But what do you think? Were you laughing along with this show? Yes and no. I mean, like, it really leans on the dramedy. It really does. But I will agree, it is almost timeless. Like, if it weren't for the equipment being somewhat antiquated, it's just as relevant today. I mean, they're dealing with assisted suicide. They're dealing with, like, teenage pregnancy. They're dealing with, like, the drug epidemic and, like, teens overdosing. The topics are just as relevant today as it was then, but, like, the writing is strong. I think it's elevated, though, by the cast. It's no secret that Elliot Gould was going to be number one on the call sheet, but this is an ensemble cast. Like, everybody knows their part and they perform it well. To me, it is the character work between those actors. There are weak parts, but the, the strong parts outweigh the weak ones and they just work so well together as a unit. Absolutely, yeah. Ensemble show and Elliot Gould, he is worth every penny, whatever they were paying him at the time because I laugh at all of his lines. I can kind of understand, like he was nominated for an Academy Award in the 60s. Like you were saying, he was a sex symbol in the 70s. He was like the ultimate man, you know? Guys wanted to be like him. The ladies wanted to be with him, including Barbara Streisand. We missed all of it but his middle-aged aloof funny guy like that's his sweet spot and he never misses on any of his line deliveries his wise guy shtick it never gets annoying like he's legitimately charming and it just comes through so well like i love every minute of him and i gotta say right there alongside him we have shuko okune's maria character i feel is the jack a harry of the series she's even almost got identical hair you know but <laughs> she's just she's so funny she's the most like cartoonish of the cast i would say she's very lovable but she's the only one that really has a catchphrase you know stay back the white line you know like that's her whole thing which this is the thing i don't know if you know she speaks in an accent which is weird to me because in the pilot she has a generic american accent but then for all of the 22 episodes of the series, she speaks with what I'm assuming is supposed to be a Filipino accent because she makes mention of her heritage several right. times throughout the series. But it's so weird because I was just like, who enforced that and told her to play a character with an accent? Because literally, like, there's no accent if you go back and watch the pilot. I wonder if there had been an accent in the stage show and they thought it wouldn't translate well, so they changed it for the pilot. And then they were like, no, nah, let's go back to what you were doing. Yeah, that's very possible because that was my thought too because it seems like it, it would it would pop more on stage as well to have the, the accent. But her flirty relationship with Fred is like the most endearing part of the show. Like, And plus she has all the memorable zingers, but every time there's a little aside to those two, I'm all smiles. I'm like, these guys are so good. And for our audience, you know, who love 80s, you know, pop culture, it should be mentioned, she voiced Jinx, the female ninja in G.I. Joe the movie. I'm just saying, if you didn't know that, there she is. Yeah, I didn't know that. <laughs> but like, no, my thing, and I know we kind of talked about this also, Totally Rad Christmas, was that this was kind of like a thing in this era where the black Asian relationship is something of a foot in the door for TV interracial relationships because we have that here and then we have Mac and his wife on Night Court. Audiences aren't going to be comfortable with a black white relationship until like the early 90s if you remember like fox's true colors where like that's the whole show of like here's this black and white interracial blended family and it lasted like two seasons but like in the early 80s they were kind of like well how about we try this pairing and see how america deals with it and i guess it worked because here we are now you know but it's just interesting that that was kind of like a formula in Hollywood at that time. Yeah, but they don't point it out. Like, they don't make a big deal about it at all. And, it, and like I say, they're 
the most endearing characters on the show. Like you, you just love everything about their relationship and they just happen to be two different races. And you're just like, whatever, like they're Fred and Maria, you know? And the other thing I want to mention is because I'm saying like, there'll be these little asides to them. I, I mentioned this also about salute your shorts and my cheers, but the fact that this was originally a play is very obvious in kind of like the masterful blocking that they have to do. Like they have a three camera setup, but 90% of the show takes place on a single set that encompasses the waiting room and the treatment area. And they jump around that space to have just like little scenes, little interactions between various characters. And it's done so seamlessly and so well. Like you forget there's not a hallway or a cafeteria like you would get on Night Court, you know, or Harry's office or whatever, you know, like there is a break room lounge, but it's mostly just used for like brief private conversations or confrontations, you know. Uh, or cigar smoking. Yeah. <laughs> having a nap, you know, for Dr. Scheinfeld. But but eventually there is one episode they go to a local bar just for a change of scenery. It's called Hula Hands. Like, they're always talking about it and they finally go there for one party. But Peter Bonners, who directed all the episodes, he's a TV veteran. He did so much stuff and it really shows that he knew what he was doing because that could have got real boring really fast. But what did you think about, like, that single set, basically? That's in my jeers. Oh, okay, okay. We'll table that. Okay. What about George Clooney as Ace? If you watch the early part of the season, it's very much, it's just this core medical staff and they're doing what they do and the patients come in and they treat a patient or there's a wacky patient or they have a little interpersonal conversation. But like, like I say, Maria's like the standout character, but then, you know, the last like five episodes of the season or something, George Clooney comes in and he's ace. He's a, uh, he's nurse Thor's nephew and I feel like he's positioned as Nick from Family Ties or Eric from Head of the Class because he's got this studded leather vest. He's got the, you know, the long 80s hair, you know, he looks like a rocker. He's wearing it over his scrubs that they just let him do that for some reason. But he's less the New York tough guy and he's more like the quirky, horny, kind of stupid rascal. But you see like, he, or he's playing stupid. I don't know, like where he falls. So he adds something to the show that I think it needed, which is a little bit more levity, a little bit more fun. But is, is he a plus for you? Is he a cheer? No. Okay. No. I understand why Clooney doesn't talk about this role too much. Like, I just, <laughs> he is a character you saw all the time in that era. Like you said, he is the Nick. He is like, he's a notch above boner. I think he was added to bring in younger viewers. And mm -hmm. like you said, levity. But I think that's at the expense of what the show was accomplishing. And then the show kind of makes little tweaks to accommodate him. Because when we saw the Christmas episode, we see Scheinfeld's daughter, played by Pamela Adlon, who is all obsessed with Clooney. Pamela Adlon's existence, I think her name's Jenny, she's a retcon. Because if you go back to the beginning of the show, Scheinfeld has one kid. He has Jonathan Silverman. He has no daughter. Yep. <laughs> but like, so it's just like, they, they're making these tweaks as they go along to see what works. And Clooney was one of them. I don't think he would have been back for a season two because I just didn't think he worked. Like, it was like they tried it and it didn't move the needle too much, but I don't know. He didn't do it for me. Interesting. Well, speaking of the tweaks and before we get into jeers here, the other thing is for the first few episodes, they had a very cool opening theme song sequence, which is the camera or the audience is the patient on a gurney being pushed around and all the staff, you know, the characters are interacting with you as their names come up on the screen. And you, know, you got this Lou Rawls song, you know, oh, we got a job to do, whatever he's singing, you know, and it's just, it's, it was very inventive and very different for the time. And then Halfway through the season, they change it to standard sitcom opening, same theme song, but now it's just clips of each character from the episodes that have come before or are to come, you know, that they've filmed. I think it was just like they're trying to say, no, we're a regular fun sitcom. This is what you want, right? And we, we got fun young people too now, you know, like, right, so yeah. Right. Well, something wasn't working. 
because as uh, often is the case, this only got one season. We got to find out what that problem was. So, Will, why don't you take us into our jeers? Boo! 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 I have a mega jeer, and everything is connected to it. And I talked about it on Totally Rad Christmas, so go check that out. But I'm bringing it back up here. This is not a hospital. <laughs> Words have meaning. And this is not a hospital. We can call this an urgent care. We can call this a clinic. Any of that works. This is not a hospital. I don't know what Webster's definition of hospital is. I'm not going to look that up. But I have a problem with the type one set structure because we've mentioned it before that we're just too smart for TV these days. But like I'm watching this show and I'm like, that's a HIPAA violation. That's a HIPAA violation. They perform surgery behind the reception desk. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, I get that it's done for blocking and staging, but come on now. Like there are two bids. They are not separated by a curtain. No one's wearing gloves unless it's actual surgery. I mean, Elliot Gould's eat pizza right next to a patient he leaves a life-saving procedure to go talk to his ex-wife about his dog i need spacing this is not a hospital maybe the definition changed but they're all on top of each other and i just i needed there to be a hallway and i needed there you shouldn't be able to walk into the hospital look to your right and watch someone bleeding out you know there's no divider there's no real door like the woman comes in whose husband had the heart attack she finds them working on the junkie and thinks it's her husband and she's able to just walk back there like the staging is detrimental but again we're too smart for tv now so i'll let it go for the 80s but that was a big issue for me watching it now yeah because if for example cheers was pretty much all one set right but it worked and that's what they've done here but no you're you're totally right that there is no separation at all between anything and yeah the the waiting room you just look right into the people getting a ventilator put on them or whatever you know like it's just like what is going on but i think the greater sin of this show is the tone er is uneven the transitions between comedy and drama, this is kind of an overused term, but it, it's literally whiplash inducing. In my opinion, it's 80% comedy and 20% drama. And unfortunately, when the dramatic stuff hits, you feel like it's slamming on the brakes. You're like, whoop, okay, there's a gurney coming in. Now it got serious. And, you know, there are funny patients that are like the walk-in patients. And most of them are coming in, you know, just kind of like, oh, you know, I got a pain in my chest. And then they can still talk and have jokes and things like that but then there are the people like the heavy duty stuff you mentioned some of them before but like the dennis franz he shook an infant and now it is damaged he's like the mother's boyfriend he's not even the father you know but he was like bad on this baby there's like a former sports star you mentioned he's in the final stages of cancer he asked them to let him die and when they revive him he's like why or most upsetting of all to me there's a man who comes in his whole family is there waiting for him to come back from a procedure it's just supposed to be standard dr sheridan says he's going to be fine and he dies on the operating table she has to come back tell the family he died and the wife slaps her but you're just like this is too heavy for a half hour sitcom that is mostly jokes because ah, again when it's not patients bringing down the show it's a it's workplace hostility they add that instead or the final episode when you have nurse thor getting diagnosed diagnosed with cancer you're just like guys why does everything have to be a downer like i think they're trying to make it realistic and shows of the 80s there was a lot of like very special episodes or they would have the sentimental moment or whatever but even then they would pepper in jokes or humor or something to keep the tone consistent and here it literally it stops now we're having serious talk now it's bad news and then it goes back to jokes a couple minutes later and you just you can never trust the the show because you're always waiting for that big bummer 
to drop and ruin everything. Yes, yes. I, I completely agree with that. And like, th again, I kept telling myself I'm too smart for this show right now because in the pilot, when we see George Jefferson, part of me is wondering like, is this canon? And this, this is an era of TV where this doesn't even matter, you know? But it's like, it becomes important because of this like breakneck tonal change. He gets shot. And I'm like, if George Jefferson dies in his dream, does he die in real life? You know, like, if he dies on ER, does he die in his own show? <laughs> and that was heavy for me, because I don't know if you know this, like, era of the Jeffersons, but if you line it up, they're about to get canceled. But, like, right before this, he had just had a serious storyline where he was stabbed by a girl gang and left to bleed out in an alley. And I'm just thinking, like, George Jefferson's having a terrible year. You know? <laughs> but it's just like, why would you do that to your, your comedic guest star? Because he was down for a couple seconds, whereas, like, it wasn't just, like, a flesh wound. But then the bullet was deflected by some jewelry. It didn't even, like, get lodged in. It bounced off and went through the wall so it's just like that tonal thing and i think a lot of it comes down to and that's why i say i have like i have like mega jeers because it's all kind of related it all comes down to it never really develops an identity outside of being adapted from a stage show the blocking the staging the side conversations but even the way characters interact. We were saying how Maria and Fred are great together and they're great together because they came over from the play. But while I think Maria is good with the rest of the cast and Maria is great with Fred, I don't think Maria and Fred are great with the rest of the cast. It's almost like they're on different levels because they're almost pros at this universe and then everybody else is a little newer to it like i can't recall any sort of meaningful interaction between Scheinfeld and fred you know it's like maria is the bridge between what er was conceived as and how it was adapted and i don't think they really smoothed that out in the season that they were given if that makes sense yeah it's clear that the, the actors did get more comfortable with each other and like they do have like more jokey stuff but it's it's uneven also for the Dr. Sheridan character. She's the hardest one because she's coming in and she's saying like, I'm the new head doctor. What I say goes. So like sub episodes, she's saying like, no, you can't leave now or you're going to be fired. Or she fires nurse Thor for challenging her and are making decisions without her because she's been the head nurse for all these years. And now she's needs to report to the new boss and all this kind of stuff. And it's just like, she comes down on everybody, but then the next episode, she's like friendly with them and they're joking and they're just like casual. It's really weird how they treat her. My main jeer about that is there's a will they won't they with Dr. Sheridan and Dr. Scheinfeld. And it is not something I, I'm rooting for at all. I never believe that the boring by the book Eve Sheridan is going to enjoy getting romantic with the easygoing, wisecracking Howard Scheinfeld. Like, and I don't want it, but they keep dropping hints where like the rest of the staff sees their attraction, but they don't, or it's just not there, or they deny it. Oh, I don't even care about her. And then they get jealous. Oh, you're dating this person? Oh, I was going to call my boyfriend and tell him that I want to have a baby, but now I'm in the break room with you and I realize how charming you are so I, I'm gonna stop that conversation I'm not gonna get to that point like but they don't actually have chemistry so it, so it just it doesn't work at all well, I'll go a step further and say that I don't like Mary McDonald as Sheridan. I like the woman from the pilot. Yeah. I thought she was the superior and I believed their interaction more. I think it's probably something that would need to be smoothed out over time. But I kind of saw the switch in Sheridan, it comes down to, and we really forget about this because times have changed, but it's that whole, like, this is the rise of the girl boss. The rise of the, like, working professional brass balls woman in industry. And here it just happens to be medicine. So it's like, she's trying, she's got the pressure that, like, everyone knows her father, who was this great surgeon or doctor at Northwestern. So she's got to, like, live 
live up to his standard, but then she's a woman in medicine. And then she's actually still relatively young. Like there's an episode where she, she tells her date of birth and she's 30. Mm -hmm. you know like if you do the math so it's like i feel like there was going to be some internal push and pull with her but like it does always come back to the tone is uneven and i'll give you another example there is an episode i want to say it's like episode six where one of shinefeld's ex-wives comes back like she wants him to take her back and she tells him that she's pregnant and i'm gonna call it check off's drugs because the b story is there's a pharma rep who comes into the hospital who's peddling all of these like phony drugs that haven't been cleared by the fda but he bribes the doctors because he gives them like sporting event tickets and sheridan says we're not going to take bribes anymore so like Scheinfeld brushes it off and he's like oh it doesn't mean anything i just throw these in a drawer somewhere and it, and he gets paid so he puts them in the drawer and the ex-wife who's trying to come back to him and who is now allegedly pregnant is in the room when this happens based on the uneven tone of this show i don't know what's gonna happen here she leaves abruptly now nothing ever comes from it but i'm thinking like this is where too smart for tv now she's pregnant she's got these non-fda approved drugs near her did she steal some is this gonna play out down the line no because tv didn't work like that so unless this is a two-part episode they will never reference this again but it's things like that where i'm like why there are a lot of decisions there would be little like side conversations with maybe thor and another staff member just off to the side that like it gives them something to do as you would in a stage show but it contributes nothing to the overall episode the show needed an editor or just a better director or something but it was so married to this stage play format that it doesn't translate well on tv like i say the laughs i really laughed when they hit they hit but just overall it always just comes down to the fact that you can't trust the show it never feels like it's gonna carry through it's not a feel good show ultimately and if you're not feeling good well then you gotta call in the doctor and it's never been more appropriate than now will we gotta save the day as the show doctors Let me tell you, my favorite thing about the show, I've said, Elliot Gould, and it's his kids. Now, the episode that we discussed with Jerry on Totally Rad Christmas, like you said, it featured Pamela Adlon as Dr. Scheinfeld's daughter, Jenny, and their banter was so entertaining. Like, the minute she entered the show, I was so happy. So, in the second season, if we're able to bring this back, I would have totally dropped the ER name and setting and made it a sitcom about a twice divorced swinging bachelor doctor who has his kids move in with him after both of his ex-wives marry each other and move to Europe. Now look, this twist, it would have been ahead of its time, but with the edginess of this show, it could have worked. Now it would I wouldn't have made it the major focal point of the series. This is not Ross's lesbian ex-wife on Friends because the TV audiences weren't ready for that yet, but that's like the setup and it's like, oh, can you believe it gets people talking and then they keep watching the show but my revamped version would be titled house calls which unfortunately i found out after i wrote this was actually the name of another medical workplace sitcom on cbs that started in 1979 apparently got pretty decent ratings for like three seasons but my version would be better let's just put it that way <laughs> so basically the premise would involve dr scheinfeld now being an unorthodox instructor at a chicago medical school where he acts as a mentor for a group of quirky medical students okay so th there would always be like a running gag about the origin 
origins of the various cadavers they study. There'll be lots of like wacky patients coming in to be examined. Now at home though, he's busy trying to deal with the needs of his son, David, who's always jumping onto the latest fad, searching for a new identity. He's going from punk rocker to preppy to environmentalist, you know, whatever it is. And then meanwhile, his daughter, Jenny, she's already just kind of like too smart for the room. She's anti-establishment. She's bucking trends. She's struggling though, being smarter than all the kids her age. So she prefers to hang out with all the mature intellectual college students he's teaching. So she's always like cutting class and, and showing up at his, whatever he's doing there in his teaching. The only returning ER characters that I see, you get Maria and Fred. But the whole thing in this the season that we got was that Maria doesn't want to get married because her parents were divorced and she's all, she's, she's like, we'll never get divorced, Fred, because we'll never get married. He's like, oh, yeah. So like now, though, they've come to that decision and they're newlyweds and they live in the same apartment building as Scheinfeld and his kids. So I think that's a, a dynamic where they're popping in and out of their lives. I do feel like just because it's a great tradition, George Clooney as Ace would also become the maintenance guy in their building, which I think is the role he played on Baby Talk. <laughs> but he would always be scoring with the single and married ladies uh, in the building, making tasteless jokes about fixing the plumbing or things getting nailed, you know? Like, the, it was the era. <laughs> he had to do it, you know? And then throughout the various episodes, ultimately, Scheinfeld is finding himself juggling his teaching career, his family life, and then becoming an unlikely marriage counselor for these two lovebirds across the hall, all the while trying to find wife number three. House calls on the new CBS Thursday night lineup for the fall 1985 season. <laughs> I like it. I'd watch it. I thought you were going to have them move over Scheinfeld's garage. You know, that trope. Everybody <laughs> lives over the garage. <laughs> this was definitely a tropey show. Yeah. Right, right, right. Okay. I'm not going to go scorched earth on it. Honestly, I don't even think it needs that many changes. I think it needs a tune-up. I think you got to trim the fat. There are a lot of components that don't need to be there. So off the bat, I'd get rid of Nurse Corey Smith. She doesn't fit. She comes off. I don't know if people will get this reference. WKRP in Cincinnati, she's Bailey. Now, a lot of people like Bailey because she's a juxtaposition to Lonnie Anderson's sex pot character, like Jennifer. But Bailey doesn't really fit either because it's like she's kind of one of the guys, but she's not really a tomboy. And she's a nerd before nerdy girls were cool. And it's the same thing here. Like, I don't think Nurse Corey pulls her weight. She doesn't really know where she fits in. And while that's something that could be worked out, I don't have time for that. So she gets thrown back into pilot season and she can end up on the fall guy or something. And then I'm not sure about Nurse Julie because throughout season one, it doesn't really seem like she wants to be a nurse. She happens to be a nurse. There are times where she's about to take her real estate exam. The episode we talked about, the Christmas episode she's willing to give up her job to get her MRS because this is that era where it's like she's just working till she gets married this isn't necessarily her calling or her career so like we come back season two nurse Julie got married and they moved to North Carolina or something but we'd have to put in another black nurse so find like some actress of that era who's not Jack A. Harry to fill that spot and then we've also talked about this but he has to go because he contributes nothing. Dr. Esquivel. Dr. Esquivel, he's not even a series regular. He's not in the credits. He's in the post credits, in the scroll. He has no personality. He's there as like, the accomplished Latin character is like, wow, he is a well-to-do doctor in this high pace. And it seems like he outranks everyone but Sheridan, but he never does anything. He'll pop in after all the excitement has happened. You know, it's almost like a Clark Kent thing. Like he pops back in like, wow, what just happened? You missed it. Superman was here. That's the <laughs> way he is. They have all these adventures. He pops in. He's like, oh, well, I was at this banquet and he speaks some Spanish and he goes, back he exits stage left so he's not necessary and i still i don't think clooney worked out so i'd get rid of him too and like so with some tweaking and some recasts the only ones i can guarantee you i am bringing back are Sheinfeld, sheridan and thor 
everybody else is a free-for-all. Because I really think the show revolves around them. You know, like Thor keeps that place grounded, and I would ramp up the will-they-won't-they they to a they-will- but you wait. <laughs> you know, like, so I think make it more of a romantic comedy set in a hospital instead of a heavy dramedy that sometimes alludes to the possibility of future romance. I have to agree. If we're just going to stick with the format, it's it's all you have to do is just get rid of the serious moments. You can lean towards, okay, we got to have a discussion here, but but you got to have just like joke, joke, joke. Let it all be jokes. And occasionally, you, you know, you can step aside and say, okay, but you know, I'm expressing my thoughts as a character and my wants and my needs, you know, but then somebody's going to take you down a peg or two with a little joke about it, you know, and you can react however you want. It needs more levity because like a concept they didn't get then but we definitely get now is you get like trauma fatigue this show was going to cause like the audience to have that another show of this era that kind of goes down that road punky brewster most people remember punky brewster for one episode and that's cherry getting locked in the freezer but if you binge punky brewster every episode is a downer that show is four years of downer <laughs> And yeah. NBC could only handle two years of that. And it's the same thing here. You got to get wacky in the 80s. A hundred percent. Yeah. So unfortunately, you know, the, the good parts didn't save it. And you could go, you know, check it out for yourself. And we'd love to hear your thoughts. Do they match up with where we're at? Or was this something you have fond memories of that you were watching at the time? And you're like, oh, it was always good. Okay, we'll listen. We'll hear. We may not agree, but we'll listen. But well, after all this medical jibber jabber, you and I, we decided to give, remember that show? 10 CCs of Summer Fun. So next time around, we're kicking off a special series we're calling Saved by the Summer. That's right. We're embarking on a four-part journey through the world of lesser-known installments of the Saved by the Bell saga, starting with the one-season prequel series Good Morning, Miss Bliss, then exploring life after graduation with Saved by the Bell the college years, followed by Saved by the Bell the new class, and finally examining the two seasons of the Peacock Saved by the Bell reimagining. Oh, it's going to be a blast. So we hope that you will join us for our adventures at Bayside and beyond. So you might think you know Saved by the Bell, but do you really know all of Saved by the Bell? Th this is going to be a fascinating journey. And of course, yes, we'll be discussing the main series as we you know get into all these others, spinoffs and whatnot. So uh, we hope that you will tell your friends and get ready for a Saved by the Summer experience with us. But in the meantime, you can find me. I'm at Hoji. Coolander on all the socials. You want to see the rest of the podcast and other projects I'm working on? You can go to theretronetwork.com, the home of Geekster. You can also find the YouTube channel, TRNTV, The Retro Network over there, where we have some fun shows. So lots of nostalgia coming your way. But meanwhile, you got to find William Bruce West. Where are you at, Will? Well, I'm on all of the socials at William B. West, or you can find me at my website, westweekever.com. And until next time, we're changing the channel. This has been a presentation of Geekster Media.